Well, we launched a spacecraft about a month ago. Its name is Kepler, named after the German astronomer. And so what this thing will do, it'll go for three and a half years, stare at the same patch of the sky, about 10 degrees by 10 degrees, right? And for three and a half years, just monitor 100,000 other suns. Now, if some of these suns have planets going around them, when it gets in front of the sun, obviously it blocks a little bit of the light that's coming towards our camera, except our camera is so exquisite, right, that even though the drop is 1,000th of 1%, the camera, which is a 90 megapixel camera, would be able to detect. And of course, the deeper the, uh, the blockage is, you know that the, the planet was larger. And the duration of the blockage will tell you about the orbit. So in about three and a half years, we will know if there are other planets like Earth around these 100,000 stars or suns. Right? Okay, so you say that, you know, I told you that in our galaxy, there are 100 billion stars. Okay, so how do we extend this information to the entire galaxy? It is almost like, you know, in the political seasons, you know how they take polls? You know, you talk to about 300 Americans and based on representative Americans, and based on what they say, you know, you sort of generalize on what America thinks, the 300 million. So this is roughly about the same thing. You know, we have taken 100,000 representative suns, and we find out whether they have planet Earths looking like around them, and then we extend it to the rest of the galaxy. So you heard it here first. In three and a half years, we will know uh, whether the galaxy is teeming with, uh, with Earth-like planets, which have, of course, one kind of implication, or in fact that we are very unique, which has completely a different kind of uh, implication. Now, the reason I tell you this is that you've got to love this. Right? I basically don't know why they came. Now, I wouldn't say that if my boss was here, right? I mean, I'm not, not that stupid. Right? So, you know, but what we do at JPL, you know, we explore Mars, we land on Venus, we bring samples of comets back, right? we ride the rings of Saturn, you know, the, uh, we watch the planet Earth, and we look for other Earths. So my, I'm blessed. When one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that at the end, and this goes to what, um, what Paris said, you have to love it. If you don't love it, it's a job. If you love it, it's not a job. You know, I've worked at JPL for 30 years. I can assure you that it looks like it was last week. Like, otherwise, when the weekend is over, you dread the fact that Monday is coming. When the alarm clock goes off at 5 o'clock in the morning, you slam it because you don't want to get up to go to work. And so you have to have a passion for this thing. And again, to Parisot's point, you know, you can't pursue it because you think, but if you're good at it, you probably will make money at it. But if you're just doing it for money, chances are that A, you will not be successful, you'll be miserable, and you will not make money either. Now, there are exceptions. In fact, the three gentlemen that will talk after the break, uh, they have made a good bit of money. <laughs> and in fact, if you can have fun in your job and make money, by all means, go for it. Okay, but don't make that to be, you know, the, the sole metric of, uh, of your success. So that's one. And so, you know, basically, I work in Disneyland, Disneyland for people like me. <laughs> now, I want to go to my second point. My second point is that no matter how, you, how much you love it, if you stay with some place for 30 years, you have to do something to keep you fresh, to give you the edge, you know, to keep you still being creative. You know, so how, you know, how do you do that? About two, three months ago, I was um, rummaging through YouTube and I came in, uh, across a uh, little piece that by Amit Kordesani, who's gonna be um, talking later tonight. So what he was saying, he was saying that, you remember when you first came here as new immigrants, and, you know, we had the cultural challenges, we had language challenges, and so what did we do? 
what we did is just we tried harder than anybody else. We were more creative than anybody else. And that forced us not only to be as good as other people, but to in fact surpass it. And his point was that 15 years, 20 years later, okay, so now you have fully assimilated into the uh, workforce. Probably you don't have the language barrier, okay. But his point was, don't lose the mindset of a new immigrant, right? That you can use you know, all uh, during your career. And I, I hope for me, you know, expand on this thing tonight. But you know, I looked at my own career and I said, in some sense, I have done that. Like my career at JPL come in five year centers. As soon as I get very comfortable with the job that I'm doing, I deliberately change position. I put myself into another position where I'm not as good as anybody else at everybody else. And then that would give me a very high uh, learning uh, curve. And that is the time that I'm the happiest. I put myself deliberately disadvantaged almost as though I was an immigrant to that particular field.